Hi, I'm Catherine Vesilopoulos. Starting my own venture wasn't easy. After a decade working in the corporate world, I realized that so many things were out of my control, like layoffs and changes in direction. I didn't like the instability. I didn't want that to define my whole career and professional story. And so I left. I started my own company and achieved more than I ever imagined. Now I'm on a mission to share stories from extraordinary entrepreneurs who are changing the world and who never gave up on their vision. This week, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Crystal Toop. She's the founder of Blackbird Medicines, a Canadian Indigenous spiritual and cultural wellness practice. She's also one of the most resilient people I've ever met. This episode isn't for the faint of heart. Crystal was born in Marathon, Ontario, and raised amid complex family dynamics and troubled neighborhoods. Her story reveals the intergenerational impacts of residential schools. Her great-grandfather's experiences in a residential school set in motion a series of events that would affect her family for generations. In the face of incredible challenges, Crystal has always found the courage to keep moving forward. She looked after her siblings at a young age. She navigated the turbulent waters of financial adversity and transient living. And through all this, her journey was filled with conflicts, choices, and discoveries. Listening to Crystal talk about her journey was an experience that I won't soon forget. She emerged from impossible circumstances, overcoming homelessness at a young age to start a family, and eventually finding her sense of purpose as a talented Indigenous storyteller. Hi, Crystal. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I think you're one of the most interesting, fascinating people we've had on the show so far. You have done a lot in your life and it's so interesting and varied. I would love for you to tell us a little bit about who you are and what is your current job? What do you do? Well, I'll just introduce myself a little formally that uh, we expect our Indigenous community members to do. Nindishnikaz de Bajamu Banisi, Sai Saiga Banoji. My name is Crystal Toop, and my traditional name is Story Healing Thunderbird. And I'm from the Morning Gross Beak clan. And a little bit about me I'm a member of the Algonquins of Pekwaknagan First Nation. I have Polish and French ancestry as well, and I am someone who is a registered social service worker. I call myself an Indigenous life spectrum doula, and what I do in the world is a lot of different things. I consider myself a community educator, a public speaker, so there's that storytelling, and I also love to write. So I I have a lot of things I do, but they all kind of stream through one of those areas or another. (laughs) It's wonderful. It's such a varied background and also something that all works together as well. I would love to hear about your childhood a little bit. Tell me how how that was for you. I was born in Marathon, Ontario. Never lived there, but the hospital for where we did live was under renovation, so my parents had to make quite the trek to get to the nearest hospital for my birth in a snowstorm in January. So Northern Ontario in January is kind of legendary. My parents grew up in Northern Ontario. My father grew up in Smooth Rock Falls. My mother was in Karamat, Ontario. These are really remote places. And so my father was this French Catholic guy from a big old French Catholic family. And my mother was from a smaller family Her father was an Algonquin man. Uh, That's where I get my community affiliation for the Pekwaknagan First Nation. The way they met was that uh, my grandfather actually met my father and his older brother in a work camp, which is still pretty common in those remote communities. He invited my uncle and my father home for dinner after work one night, and him and my mother hit it off immediately, got very smitten very quickly, and... Uh, Before too long, they were married, and not much longer, I came along. I have to say, we really moved around a lot in my upbringing. We moved from northern Ontario to Ottawa, 
And that was really uh, my father in those early years when myself and my sister came along. He had been working these jobs where he would come home on the weekend. So my mother would be alone with us for long stretches of time. So obviously that wasn't ideal <laughs> for anybody, anywhere. And we moved to Ottawa uh, right before I started junior kindergarten. It was a very uh, interesting time. I know now that we lived in a very troubled neighborhood, I'll say. There was a lot of gangs, there was a lot of biker infiltration. And I remember there was a really tragic situation where someone a few blocks over had, there was like this domestic violence kind of murder-suicide thing. And my parents, both being from small towns, sort of looked at each other and it's like, okay, time to get out of the city. So we hiked back up to Northern Ontario. Oh, wow. Uh, but that was temporary because my parents struggled to find work. And uh, there was a decision that my dad would move to uh, a job opportunity he had in Montreal. So he made that trek. And during the time of that, uh, my parents decided to divorce. So uh, my sister and I chose to go live with my father. And so we moved to Montreal. Do you remember thinking as a child um, that this was a lot of movement or this just became a normal part of your life? It was very normal, I think. Uh, I was someone in school who struggled a lot with bullying. Basically, I was a chunky kid. I'm a pretty thick, broad person in general. And uh, when I was a kid, you know, just like so many other uh, young people, there was a big fixation on bodies and all these other things. And uh, so I, I just experienced so much bullying. So when it was time to move, I was so ready for a new group of yes. people. It's like, yes, get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and so life in Montreal for you, how do you compare that to Ontario? It was interesting. I found we lived right near this uh, cool kind of forest that had trails and... There was a big focus I found on outdoor lifestyle, I guess. I noticed there was a lot more focus on environmentalism and, yeah, just vitality and healthy living. It was also a difficult time just living in a single parent household. Of course, two girls with their dad. There was challenges there, particularly around, you know, menstruation and things like that. Um, but it was an exciting time because we had been in such a remote place where there was one paved road before that. So going to like such an extreme opposite, uh, it was very exciting. It was super exciting. And I had so much more independence. Being the oldest of four, at the time it was just two of us, I was able to go on bike rides and we'd go swimming at the community pool and check out the library and all these. And I ended up taking a babysitter's course there. So. That was the, the very start of me earning my own money. Do you remember when you first understood that you were a child of a multicultural family? I think I had... My mother had started to look at reclaiming culture, and our house being in Ottawa was a really important stop point for folks who were traveling to different political demonstrations. My mother has a younger sister and a younger brother, and her younger sister at the time was a university student. And I just remember going to bed just like any other kid and waking up to a house full of Native people sleeping on the floor. And of course, as a kid, I didn't know the difference between Native or not Native, but I was in this situation where I was playing on the playground and I knew my mother had said, like, you're Native. And I didn't really have a concept of what that meant except that it was something that I could argue with people about that, well, yeah, I am Native, actually, and then I'm going to ask my mom, I'll prove it. So <laughs> that was kind of it. My mother, they weren't raised with their culture. Her father certainly had had lots of grounded reasons and fears around not tr passing on the language, not maintaining those traditions. And so my mother very lightly started to reclaim those things where she started to learn about the sacred medicines. And we had sacred medicines on our entryways with the four directions in our home. But that is really where it felt like it stopped for me. But outside of those, those visits from my aunt with all of her university friends, uh, and it wasn't until much, much later that I realized actually that whole group of people were on their way to the Oka protests 
or they were, you know, so there was like, we were this kind of background story on these really important political actions that were happening and in, in the movements that young Indigenous people were taking to have their voices heard. Did you ever have to prove to people that you were Indigenous, Native? Always. I still have to, every day. Mm-hmm. I present as a white woman, and that's absolutely uh, something that I had to learn about as a privilege and and what that really means to have white privilege and how to wield it. But within my own family, there was almost some kind of... Uh, I mean, they were supposed to be jokes, but it was very clear that I was the white one and my sister was the brown one. So even within our own little family unit, we were othered from each other. And there was conversations that I look back on with a whole new lens as an adult, like many of us do, that made me realize that there was that othering there. And uh, as I got older, I mean, I, I ended up getting my status card when I was about 12 years old because I, I really needed braces. And that's what that status card helped with. We were certainly a low-income family, but my mother was someone who had lost her status because she had married my father, a white man, she lost her rights, whereas her father had married a French-Polish woman and she became a status member as a white woman. So there was these politics that were always impacting my life that I had zero awareness of as a kid. And I would found out later, we had had this really traumatic experience living in Ottawa where a neighbor or someone had made a crank call to the police and they said that my father had actually killed my mother and myself and my sister. <sighs> and he was, you know, basically just this horrible, horrible story. So we were actually woken up in the middle of the night by a whole task force making sure that we were alive. They had just run in and taken over the whole house. Oh my goodness. And I found out later that was actually, you know, that was an act of racism from someone in the neighborhood who wanted to cause trouble for my mother, who was an indigenous woman. So to to not have, you know, just have these experiences and growing up being afraid of police and not quite knowing why, um, it's always something that, you know, it took a lot of unpacking for sure. And and it is, like I said, it's a big part of my my storytelling arsenal. (laughs) That's heavy and not not every child goes through that. And, And the ones who do, you have to spend your life surviving that, I guess. And And it was, nobody talked about it. Um, I thought it was a bad dream I had had probably until I was in my teens. And then I had overheard my mother on the phone telling the story. And I was like, wait, that actually happened? Right, right. And she just talked about it was like it was some kind of epic prank. And I'm thinking, this is like a, this is a trauma puzzle piece. <laughs> Definitely. So as a young woman, like you went to school and you got your degree, were you ever trying to run away from that and say, I just want to live a life that doesn't involve all this or like how did you make the decision to go into social work well that was all much later actually uh Mm -hmm. i didn't really find much success with post-secondary studies until i was in my 30s and a parent of two myself before all of kind of this pathfinding i was floundering for years i continued to bounce back and forth between my parents homes Uh, I had very high conflict relationship with my mother. I continue to have a high conflict relationship that's actually now been no contact for about five years. Why is that? Uh, It's like they say, you have to be a cycle breaker and you have to address what you can within your own generation for the betterment of the next. And that's certainly what I've tried to do with my family. But if the generation before you isn't well enough to do that work, it gets passed on. Mm -hmm. So for my family, there's just a lot of unaddressed mental illness that stems from generational impacts of residential school. So if you think about my great-grandfather who was apprehended at age four to attend one of these schools, he had lived his life in the bush, on the land, completely undisturbed. And then he fought in World War II. After getting out of residential school, he signed up and he was a gunner. He's a decorated war veteran. And he gets back from the war and he died before he was like 57. And he had nine kids right away. 
the wow. kids all spoke Anishinaabewan, but by the time my grandfather was 12, he couldn't remember that language. And so within one generation, my family left the land, my family lost their language. And when you don't have such large essential pieces of how you relate to each other as a family, then you know the impacts of that on the next generation are monumental. And so my mother was that next generation. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons that we don't have a relationship now. You know, as the oldest of four children, I was a parental figure for my siblings. And it's really shaped who I am. But going back and forth and not seeing eye to eye with my parents who are supposed to be, you know, parenting me, uh, I didn't feel that growing up. I didn't feel parented. I felt... Um, really kind of alone. I felt neglected. I felt isolated. And I felt like I had to figure things out on my own. And that's what I did. I'm really lucky that I have a passion for reading. I have a passion for learning. And those two passions carried me through so much in my life. But it's also made me a bit of an adventurer. Mm -hmm. So by the time I was 16... I was really fed up with my parents. <laughs> like so many teenagers are, now that I have teenagers, I know. Uh, but I was supporting myself through my babysitting. I was buying my own clothing. My parents were both very low income. My father worked very hard, but he didn't make as much as we needed. And so from about 12 years old, I started supplying my own clothing, supplying my own needs. If I wanted a yearbook or to eat lunch at school, these were things I paid for myself. And so after about four years of doing that, you start to look around and go like, what the heck are you people for? You just stress me out. So uh, I would get into a lot of conflict situations with my parents, which would result in me getting kicked out. So I'd go to the one house, the other house. And that became tricky because sometimes, well, most of the time, my mother lived across the province of Ontario from me. So when my parents separated, my dad moved us to Montreal and my mother stayed in Northern Ontario. It was difficult, but at the same time, I had already started to form my own foundation without my parents' guidance. So by the time uh, I was 16 in, in grade 11, I was living in Thunder Bay that time trying to get along with my mom and she had had uh, another two children. My half siblings were 12 and 15 years younger than me. I felt a lot of responsibility for my younger siblings. I often, you know, upon hindsight and reflection, I often made choices based on what I found were my obligations to care for my younger siblings. So my mom decided she was going to move up to Thunder Bay. She had moved to our town for the first time. We were very excited to have her living in the same town with us again, especially with our little siblings. And she didn't even last more than a year. And she decided, well, I'm going to move back up to Thunder Bay. And instead of losing out on my younger siblings again, I, d I opted to go with her because my relationship with my father had deteriorated. Uh, so I w found myself going to high school in Thunder Bay. <laughs> And we lived in a very bad part of town. My grandparents lived close by. And just like always, just like everywhere I always was, I started working. And I didn't even complete my first semester of grade 11. But my mother kicked me out in Thunder Bay. And I was embarrassed to contact my grandparents for help. I was embarrassed to reach out to the supports I have. And... I, you know, had to figure it out on my own, like I thought that I was supposed to do. So yeah, I, I was couch surfing in Thunder Bay in December. I managed to connect with a wonderful nonprofit organization, uh, Operation Come Home. And because I was, you know, of limited means, they were able to pay for my bus ticket to come back to Ottawa. And at least I had a place to stay with my dad. But that again was temporary. That time between surviving in Thunder Bay and coming back to the Ottawa area, I started what I call my street life chapter and started trying to survive on my own as a 16-year-old in downtown Ottawa. And I found a family on the streets. I found friendship and safety. 
And that's something that a lot of people don't understand about homelessness. When you are living in that lifestyle, in that environment, you very quickly build trust with your peers and they look out for each other. There was something about street life that the morals of it, the black and white of good and bad, that really spoke to me and how I wanted to live my life. I got stuck in street life for a while. I hated not having a place to sleep. Not knowing where I was gonna put my head down every night just stressed me. And it still stresses me if, you know, if we're traveling or something and we haven't booked a hotel, like, I get so agitated. <laughs> yes. Um, but, but can I ask you, how did you determine who you could trust? Because you were young. You were developing a very strong sense of independence without a, a roadmap. And like, who do you trust in those moments? I was lucky, lucky slash unlucky. <laughs> Um, I went into that lifestyle with my best friend from high school. We had met in grade nine. Uh, I was going to school in Chesterville, Ontario. She was also struggling with her home life. And when I said, okay, I'm coming back to Ottawa, you know, she was ready. So I had a friend that I could trust. But we operated in very different social circles in street life. She was actively sleeping outside. And she was also actively uh, abusing substances. And I wasn't. <laughs> I was couch surfing and working at the bay. Mm -hmm. I was selling wigs. And <laughs> I always struggled. Like, I always tried to maintain my employment because she would panhandle, but I, I couldn't. So there was so many people you meet. And the thing about traumatized people is that they will disclose their trauma like you and I might discuss a weather report. It's very nonchalant. It's a very big part of our identity, the trauma we've gone through. You kind of see the heart of people. And really, being 16 years old and meeting other people in that same age range so many of them were group home runaways. So very many of them were children who had parents with addictions or who were neglecting them and nobody was looking for them. So there was a lot of us who were surviving out there. And when you feel safe with somebody, it's very instinctual. For myself, my mother, had undiagnosed and untreated mental illness. So quite a lot of my survivorship was gauging people's feelings. Am I safe to be around you right now? Where are you at? What are you feeling? And I didn't know how I should feel until I could assess others. That skill served me very well in street life. Who is a threat versus who isn't? So I had some good instinctual skills that I brought to that existence. And yeah, it, it sounds like mind it. You, there yeah. was a <laughs> there was a few times I was just in these situations like, how did I get here? I didn't even consider these problems. I write about one uh, activity where I was in a stolen car and we were on the highway and we were supposed to be driving to Cornwall for some reason. And I remember thinking on the highway, on the Queensway, it's like, nobody knows where I am. Nobody knows where we're going. If I don't come back here, like, they don't have to stop in Cornwall. We could end up anywhere. Like, I had, it just hit me over the head. Like, I was in danger. <laughs> so there was a lot oh, of... Wait, hold on. How did you get into that car? Tell me Well, it was a boy. Happened. It was a boy. I had a... Uh, and boys. he actually became my children's father. He, he offered 50% of that DNA for me. He stole a car, then he stole your heart. That's it. It's a mm -hmm. tale as old as time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I find it interesting, the whole concept of bonding over trauma. And that people who are not homeless, maybe they don't bond over that. That's not something that people readily talk about when they first meet. And then in your case, you're telling me that people were talking about it so nonchalantly that it becomes that street currency almost. Absolutely. Correct me if I'm wrong. Absolutely. Street currency is a great way to kind of term it because there's what we call seasonally homeless people. Youth who have good lives at home, good parents, but they're sick of those roles and they're sick of coming in at curfew and they're sick of getting grounded because they didn't get good grades. They leave home and they live on the streets and they just 
torture their poor, lovely parents. And there was absolutely kids like that who came downtown and, and they were really a target and a joke to the kids who were there because they had nowhere else to be. Mm-hmm. So you really could tell very quickly who was and wasn't safe. You could tell very quickly who wasn't healthy, but would protect you. You know, if somebody, oh, let's say, what the heck did everybody, back then everybody was robbing pay phones. That was the big ticket. Steal a car, pry a pay phone out of the booth, and then spend the next week paying for everything oh. in quarters. You know, it would take one person would have a windfall, and if we were all staying, it's one person's apartment, and there was 12 of us, that one person who successfully got this money, they would share with everybody. Oh, wow. Everybody would eat that night. Everybody would have cigarettes that night. Everybody would, you know, have toilet paper in the house. So there was real care offered in those times. I find that fascinating because that person could have easily just kept everything to themselves, but instead they're, they're still community-minded. Exactly. Even in the toughest of times. Absolutely. Wow. wow. Well, how long did you do this? How many years? Oh, until I got pregnant. <laughs> how, how old were you when that happened? Uh, I was 18. My son was born at the end of 2000. By that time, I had already gotten an apartment. I had been off the couch surfing and into my own place, but then I had become the communal drop-in. So I was the safe place that people brought toilet paper to. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> my boyfriend at the time had gotten out of prison <laughs> he had been arrested for all of his you know behaviors and yeah it was probably spring he'd been out for maybe a month and a half and I found myself pregnant and pretty quickly I knew that I wanted things to change I knew that I wanted to you know it was it was different very quickly from looking after my siblings and making decisions based on their best interest making decisions based on my son's best interest became you know of vital importance i started doing prenatal classes i started setting boundaries within my home for all these people but it took time and i also again these were the people that i had come to rely on for safety you know, if I hadn't eaten in a day or two, this was the group of people who would make sure I got something in my stomach. It was hard to move away from that community. And I didn't completely extract myself from that community until my daughter was born, mm -hmm. which was six years later in 2006. Okay. So a lot of the kids who had made friends on the streets, many of us started to exit street life by getting a home. The numbers of street kids were unprecedented. There was a lot of talk around the Safe Streets Act. Homelessness was being criminalized in a way that it hadn't been before. And I found my advocacy boots in those spaces. And I started facilitating youth liaison type of work with police, service providers, and being asked to, uh, by Operation Come Home, who had traveled me, they were asking me to do speaking engagements. Oh, that's and great. And so I was yeah. showing up in front of CSIS and Canada Post workers and talking about how the Safe Streets Act had impacted myself and my community. Mm -hmm. So it was a long road to fully break free of street life, but uh, getting a home was step one. And I was one of the first street kids who had a baby that I was trying to access the youth drop-in because I needed to do laundry. And so they had to have meetings and create policies because I was the only one trying to enter the drop-in with a baby. And they had to consider safety and things like that. So mm -hmm. a bit of a trailblazer, if you will. Well, that's it. I was going to say that's very <laughs> pioneering of a, of a journey and, and for you to be able to do that. So tell me more about how then you, your, your children started to grow up a little bit and you found yourself to be in your late 20s, I guess, at this point, if I'm doing the math. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what happened after that? I managed to finally, once and for all, end this on and off relationship with their bio dad and set some things down that I needed to set down once and for all. But I still found myself in unhealthy relationships, romantic relationships. So that pretty much occupied the rest of my 20s was these unhealthy relationships. I was in two long-term relationships and 
I thought I was doing better because, hey, I'm not homeless. And hey, you know, I make sure my kids have what they need and nobody's ever going hungry. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I listen to them and I, I look after them and things like that. I've already broken away from what was normalized for me and okay. created, like you said, those new pathways. Yeah. But I had no idea the work that I needed to invest in myself and in my own healing and my own wellness to realize the cycle breaking that would make up a huge part of my 30s and early 40s. At that point, uh, I started working in Minwasha Lodge, the Indigenous Women's Support Center. My daughter was two years old, so I was 28, and I had a shiny mall college diploma computer business application specialist, which meant I was really, really good at Microsoft Office. And uh, (laughs) I became an executive assistant and a human resources assistant. And for the first time, I'm working nine to five. I got a car. I'm not working for minimum wage anymore. I'm working for double minimum wage. (laughs) So it was very, very exciting. But all of a sudden, I'm faced with a flood of what does it mean to be an indigenous woman? And, oh gosh, it hit me like a ton of bricks. You know, I was working in this organization and they said, well, indigenous applicants are priority based on section, blah, blah, blah. So I thought, okay, good. This looks good. So I applied and got the role. I did really well. It was an undefined role. I was struggling because at that time, my family didn't know about our residential school history in our family. It was a secret. Mm -hmm. And my family, we didn't talk about the ways that we had been disconnected from our indigeneity. So for myself, it's always been just like a fun fact about me. It wasn't something I felt that I embodied or even that it was something that I was allowed to claim. So I'm working in this place with literally 40 First Nation Inuit Métis staff women. I'm participating in ceremony for the first time in my life. I did a sweat lodge and I learned about all these different parts of culture. And and I'm, of course, helping the executive director and I'm her go-to person. And I remember clearly we had this one ally. uh, She was a Métis lawyer who had written some really great papers uh, and in collaboration with the organization. And she was presenting on one of these papers and it was very statistic heavy. And she's spitting out these statistics. One in four indigenous women will be sexually assaulted. One in five, one in six, like all these different numbers, you know, will experience domestic violence and I'm soaking all this up. But all of a sudden I, I had to get out of the room because I'm having a full blown panic attack and I had no awareness as to what was happening or why Mm -hmm. and so I went into counseling and therapy and things like that and I started to unpack it and have conversations with others in my workplace you know I didn't find out about the residential school history in my family until about six years ago so I was still very far from that knowledge but all I knew was that these statistics had triggered me in a way that reading all these you know reports and things hadn't And it's because those statistics applied to me. Every statistic she shared, I had had relevant life experiences associated with it. Oh, wow. So uh, it was strange because I identified with being a First Nations woman as far as my lived experiences. Right. But I couldn't pair that with like, you know, I'm not allowed to be Native. I'm not Native enough. And so that's where I had to start unlearning and being surrounded by other Indigenous women who looked in all different ways, shades and shapes, learning about shadism and how this is a tool in continue that infighting so that we're not stronger together because we're too busy fighting over who does and doesn't belong. So those were really important times for me to kind of get my head around being an Indigenous woman and also feeling comfortable to say that, yeah, I'm an Algonquin woman. Do you remember any experiences talking to these women in your work environment and what they were teaching you? Well, I mostly experienced questioning. And I understand now that that is part and parcel of being a member of the Indigenous community because I am white presenting. I have to position myself and say the names of my relatives and say the name of my community. But I was 
experiencing challenges because certain people thought I wasn't. I was making it up. Hmm. And I, I experienced workplace bullying as a result until so-and-so realized, hey, she actually knew my auntie. And then she started being nice to me, has been nice to me ever since. So those experiences by itself taught me a lot about, like, there's a lot of protocol in First Nations communities. And that's something that I've always struggled with. You know, when I was doing my doula training, the facilitator invited her auntie, who was like this superstar neuroscientist type of Haudenosaunee, wonder kind, awesome matriarch. She said, you know, our ancestors were intelligent and you descend from intelligent beings. And that was the first time at age 35 that I'd ever heard that because growing up, the message is native people are drunks. They're a mess, they're embarrassing, they're gross. Even as a street kid, I remember telling a friend of mine, there was this one couple, and they were very, very street entrenched, and they were visibly Inuit. They were kind of targeted on the streets. And I remember telling a friend, it makes me sad sometimes because Ottawa is such a big tourist city people from all over the world come here and it's bad enough people think indigenous folks are extinct and then they see an inuit person on the street and they're inebriated and this tourist is going to go home and think this person represents all indigenous people in canada and you know i've i've learned so much about the inuit community since those days and i'm really grateful for learning about how wonderful inuit people really are but that was something that stood out for me when i was learning about you know reconnecting uh it was really just talking with others who are doing the exact same work one lady talked to me she was the head of the counseling department and we had this conversation about how her mother had sold her status during the war because Mm -hmm. her children were starving. Yes. The Indian agent came around and offered her money, sell your status and leave the community, but you're going to get enough money to survive the winter with your children. And that's the choice that a lot of families had to make. You want to go to school and be a lawyer? Well, guess what? You're not Native anymore. You don't have any more Indigenous rights. So good luck with your law degree. So there's so many stories like this, and I had never heard any of them. Learning about residential school, learning about the 60s scoop, learning about colonization and what that looked like was such a huge journey. We all took history, (laughs) in my school anyway, in Upper Canada. They had a paragraph that said, you know, how the Europeans came and saved the Indigenous people. And that was the paragraph, and then we moved on with history teachings. But my children's bio dad, he was a 60 scoop survivor. So he had been adopted out of uh, Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan as an infant. And, you know, when we met in that drop-in for homeless youth, we were two native kids who knew nothing about being native. And he continued a trajectory in and out of correctional institutions. Mm -hmm. But my trajectory meant, how do I keep my kids out of those institutions? How do I right, to break the cycle? Exactly. Exactly. Mm. And I remember getting pregnant with my daughter and finding out it was a girl. I felt devastated. Like, I, I don't feel like I'm a strong Indigenous woman. How will I teach her to be a strong Indigenous woman? And it's only now, many years later, mm. where she's almost 20 years old, that I can say, actually, I'm crazy strong for an Indigenous woman. And I, I've given her a really good role model. So. <laughs> <laughs> If I do say so myself. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I want to talk about the term doula and how that played into your life, how you got into it and what it means and the different phases of it and how that brings you back to your, your ancestry. In 2015, I responded to some Facebook ad that said free full-spectrum doula training in partnership with Dona International, which is the creme de la creme of doula trainings, in partnership with the Native Youth Sexual Health Network. So they were offering this training, and it was about reclaiming birth work and birth teachings. And, you know, I, I always identified as a mother, and having birthed two people was very powerful for me, especially being 18 and 26 years old. And I had grown up around like kind of being fascinated about birth 
I was just fascinated with my aunt's pregnancies and I would have predictions about what the gender of these babies would be. And I was always right, which just cemented my curiosity even more. I remember when we were living in very remote Karamat, Ontario, there was a girl who was, I was in grade five and she was in grade seven. And this town was so small, the school from JK to grade eight, including janitorial teaching staff, admin staff was 30 people. She was complaining about having like tender breasts and being sore and uncomfortable. And she was a bigger girl. And we lived at least a two hour drive from a doctor. And that doctor came once a month. So medical assistance was rare. And we relied a lot on home remedies and, you know, wives tales and things like that for dealing with earaches and infections. So she disappeared one day. And then when the word came out that she had been pregnant, she didn't know it. And she had delivered prematurely a little girl. And I remember just being like, how did she not know she was having a baby? And so there was this huge lack in sexual health education, reproductive education, like just we didn't know how our bodies worked. So that just really stuck with me. And so fast forward to this doula training, and I'm kind of in this weird place. I'm about uh, two years into my undergrad degree. I'm in this training without knowing my sister, uh, the one that's two years younger, she also signed up for the exact same training. We just unbeknownst to each other wound up in the exact same training learning about pregnancy and birth. And this is something that we had fulfilled for each other it was a companion, like the person who was cheering the other on and that support person in labor and delivery and definitely in pregnancy. This is where I hear for the very first time this amazing Haudenosaunee auntie talking about you know, your ancestors are intelligent. Your ancestors would have had ways to teach each other about our bodies. We would have had ways to understand the cycles of our menstruation. I felt like, oh, of course, like this is so logical, but it was just having someone say it, you know, without any derogatory connotations. It was really powerful. And throughout my kind of reclamation journey, I guess, when I was maybe about 10, we had had a powwow in this remote town of Karamat, which is Ojibwe territory. And, you know, we organized the powwow. I had my first regalia. I had my coming out. I had danced. And there was, you know, these kind of protocols that I had gone through, but I didn't really feel very connected to them. And so I didn't continue them after that particular experience. So in my 30s, I'm trying to... I always wanted my kids to feel like they belonged. I didn't want them to go through the experience of saying, am I Indigenous enough? I didn't want them to question who their community was and who mm -hmm. they belonged to. I wanted them to know that. So since pregnancy, I had been, you know, I went to prenatal classes with Indigenous organizations, the Friendship Center, things like that. Both my children had walking out ceremonies. And that's where the baby, the feet, the idea is that the baby is so loved in that first year that their feet never touch the ground until Aww. they're, yeah, isn't that beautiful? That's and great. Until their first year when they're able to walk. And then we have a ceremony yeah. and they walk on the earth for the first time. I had these things for my children, but I just was so hungry for so much more. But again, I'm not finding my passion at powwows or uh, singing or drumming. And uh, through that training, I had this big aha moment where I realized I do have a traditional role, and that is an auntie. I'm an auntie. I'm a big sister. I'm a mother. Those by themselves are traditional roles. You don't have to dress it up any more than that. They're traditional roles. Uh, so these teachers for this doula training framed it as... You don't have to have given birth to be a doula. You don't have to be some, you know, reproductive justice guru. You can just be a really caring auntie. Thank you so much to Crystal Toop. You can learn more about the Blackbird Medicines through the link in the episode description. If you found Crystal's story inspiring, we would love it if you could please rate, review, and subscribe to And So She Left wherever you listen. 
Your feedback helps us to better serve current listeners and reach new ones. To make it even easier, we're launching a quick feedback form. It's just five questions long, and it would help us immensely if you could please take a few minutes to fill it out. Your responses directly impact the creation of the show, and we want to make the show that you want to hear. And So She Left is made by Consulta and Ethan Lee. We'll be back next Wednesday with a new episode. Our music is by Chris Zabriskie, edited for your enjoyment. You can find a list of all the songs you heard here in the episode notes. I'm Catherine Vesilopoulos, and thanks for listening. <laughs>